Well, hi, boys and girls. My name is Dick Cully, and welcome to Musicians on the Record with Dave Ward. Hit it! Musicians on the record. Bring it on. Hi, welcome to Musicians on the Record. I'm David Ward. You've heard the music, now hear their story. And I'm so happy to have on the show jazz drumming great Dick Cully is here with us today. Welcome, Dick. Good afternoon, Dave. Pleasure to meet you and to be with you. Absolutely. So glad you're here. And uh, I was saying before, I'm getting to talk to so many great drummers and musicians, and I wanted to talk with you. You've hung out with some pretty amazing cats uh, as far as drummers and musicians, and I want to talk about that. But let's start with the beginning for you of how did you get to be you know, where you are with drumming, when did you start falling in love with drums and music in general? Um, well, um, my mom was like uh, actually a Rosie the Riveter. She worked for the Defense Department during the Second World War, and my father was drafted in the uh, Army. He was in the U.S. Army for four years during the Second World War. My mom... She used to go to the Paramount and like the Ed Sullivan Theater and she used to go see Glenn Miller and Tommy Dorsey and Frank Sinatra. And my dad, he like, uh, he used to go to the Apollo Theater. All right? wow. And he went to Birdland, he went, he hung out at all the, the dance uh, halls like Roseland and Ar yeah. the Arcadia Ballroom. And that's what people did in the 40s. Yeah. And I grew up in a household that always had music. Mm. If it wasn't on the radio, they were playing records. And if it wasn't on the record player or the phonograph, it was on the TV with the rabbit ears with the tinfoil yeah. on it, you know, yeah. and, and that was it. Um, I just loved music. Um, I didn't take an interest in drumming until I was about 16 years old. Wow. Believe it or not, what made me get interested in drumming was the soundtrack to the movie Goldfinger. The James Bond movie? James Bond movie. Yes. Okay. The drumming in that just fascinated me. And it was the motivation that, yeah, that's how I wanted to start playing. So when I was 16, uh, I was banging on pots and pans around the house with the wooden spoons and stuff. And uh, I asked my parents if uh, I could take drum lessons. And uh, that's pretty much how it started. I... Um, studied with a, a gentleman who was uh, studying at Juilliard School of Music. His name is Jim Rago, and he was studying with Sal Goodman, the percussionist, the timpanist player. Yes. And Jim has been with the Louisville Symphony Orchestra for about 45 years. But he was the one that um, uh, taught me the basics. Okay. And my father had a friend that uh, actually managed the Arcadia Ballroom. He knew Buddy Rich. And Gene, he knew Buddy Rich when he was in Vaudeville. He knew wow. his parents. Wow. So when I was 16 years old, I got to meet, I was introduced to Gene and to Buddy. And uh, I got to meet Louis Belson and Max Roach and Art Blakey. I mean, I got to meet all of these cats. Yeah. And um, I mean, I was lucky. I mean, I'm at the wrong, I was at the wrong place or at the tail end of like the big band era. Okay. All right. But, um, you know, I got to meet these guys. Yeah, let's And, and um, I'm very flattered to be considered uh, paired to Buddy or Gene or Chick Webb or, or, or any of those cats because they really are the greatest drummers in the world. I have never self-proclaimed myself to be the greatest, the fastest, the best, or this or that or whatever. The association came from other people. Not, not myself. Got it. I'm about music. Okay. I wanted to play the drums, not to play drum solos or to be rich and famous. I wanted to play the drums because it was the only instrument I could play well enough to be in a band. Uh. <laughs> you know? 
I didn't. I couldn't play piano. I tried the bass, and okay. like I tried the trumpet, and like forget yeah. about it. You're right. I was only good at hitting things, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. like but, people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I wanted to do something that made people happy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and music made me happy. And when I, I played a band, and I saw people out there dancing or smiling or whatever. You know, I mean, uh, how often do you get to do something in life that makes other people happy that, right? Yeah, exactly. So that was it. So, you know, uh, I took lessons for a year okay. with uh, Jim. And then um, in 1967, I uh, attended Berkeley uh, School of Music in Boston. It wasn't an affiliated college at the time. It was just still a music school. Okay. And um, I studied with Alan Dawson. Uh, I kind of got depressed and quit, and uh, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to pursue music anymore, you know, yeah. but uh, my love for it was just overwhelming, and then um, I uh, studied with uh, Ed Shaughnessy in New York. How did that, was... how did you even connect with Ed? <clears throat> well, uh, my first drum teacher, Tim Rago, had a friend that was studying with him, and uh, he was the one that made the connection. Uh, Eddie lived out on uh, Long Island. And uh, I mean, he gave me like a really good interview before he would even accept me as a student. You know, like he didn't want a beginner. Okay. He was, you know, he was dead serious about, well, you got to be serious about, you know, what we're going to do. Sure. This was 1969. I think I, I recall paying him like $35 for a half hour lesson, which was a lot of bread for a 20 year old kid. Bad. Days, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, I had to travel from New York to New Jersey, or New Jersey to New York, rather, and back on a bus and walking and everything else. So it was a, a commitment. You bet. Yeah. And um, and he worked me. I mean, we went through a bunch of uh, you know books and methods, and uh, uh, he actually Eddie Shaughnessy is the man that changed my life. He was the one that suggested that I teach. Or get involved in in, in, uh, in uh, instructing. Wow! And um, um, I don't think of myself as a teacher. Um, yeah. I don't teach somebody how to play the drums. Okay. I share what others have shared with me. Okay. And you apply it the way you want. You Got know. It. Got it. I mean, you can go on the internet and Google drum lessons, okay, and you'll get 25 million hits. <laughs> and now, are they all experts? I don't know about that, but, you know, um, I don't tell people what to do. This is what works for me, and if it works for you, that's, that's fine and dandy. But um, the band, the big band, that came about uh, simply because no one would hire me. Hmm. Okay. When I relocated, I, uh, I relocated with my parents and um, my father had had a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And when he had an opportunity re to retire, um, he came to Florida. Okay. And um, most of my friends and everybody that I grew up with, uh, they were married, they had kids. And um, as far as the music scene, I've, you know, I kind of stretched as much as I thought that I was going to be able to. So... But I wanted to be with my parents. I especially wanted to be with my dad. Sure. And um, uh, so when I came to Florida for like four first four years, I couldn't get arrested. I mean, I went to the musicians' union. I went to the, all of the club date offices. I went to uh, nightclubs and bars, try to sit in, you know, meet other musicians. Sure. And um, uh, I couldn't get any work. Wow. And so my father said, uh, well, if you can't get in the band, start your own. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's true. So rather than put a trio or a quartet or something together, um, I decided, well, well, let's do something big, hmm. like a big band. Yeah. yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, so with his help and um, a local uh, instructor at a college here at FAU, his name was Bill Prince, uh, uh, I acquired a bunch of arrangements and music stands or whatever, and uh, I worked on uh, getting a gig. Wow. And um, 
I had a, uh, there was a brand new Holiday Inn that had opened up and they had a lounge in it. It was called the Bounty Lounge. It was beautiful. It was like a two story building and it had a replica of the HMS Bounty in it as a ship. Really? Yeah. Okay. Big dance floor, nice stage and everything. And my goal was if I could get to play in this place one night a week, yeah. I'll be happy. Okay. So I uh, haunted the owners for about three months. And they finally gave me an opportunity, April 11th, 1982. I'll never forget it. It was my opening night. Wow. And I was only supposed to be there, Dave, one night. Yep. Get hired for one night. Okay. And I turned that one night into a seven-year gig and a 25-year career. Wow. That's pretty good. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, um, unexpectedly, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, things happen. But, uh, I'm about the music. Yeah. Um, you know, um, uh, there's there's so many other cats out there that can tell you about the technical, the mechanics, and, and, and sure. this and that. And yeah. I mean, I can share that too, but, yeah. um, you know, music makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about that, Dick. What is it that you love about <coughs> the music? What What is it about it that makes you happy, especially the music? Well, music is emotion. I mean, it's it can make you happy. Um, you can listen to a song that maybe you heard 30, 40 years ago, and it'll take you back to a place in time or with someone. Uh, you know, there's not too many things that can do that, you know, and um, it makes it sad, uh, you know, uh, romantic. Right. You know, I mean, it's life. It's, it's you know... Um, that's why I love music. I mean, imagine a world without music. I know, and, right? You know, Louis Louis Armstrong, okay, the father of jazz, yeah. often said that, that there are only two types of music, good and bad. Yeah. <laughs> I play the good, right. you know? And it's not about, and it's not about genre, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, really, there are all, I mean, they're good and bad, you know, like there's good sure. and bad music. Sure. There are, there are people that can't believe that when I was younger, when I was in my 30s, well, late 20s actually, I toured a bunch of Holiday Inns around um, the South mm -hmm. working with a, a, a country pop band. Interesting. A country band. Yeah, That's wow. Me, country. <laughs> <laughs> Those two worlds now, fit, right? <laughs> it, well, it did. Uh, drumsticks was all that mattered, okay? Right. I've worn I've worn Lederhosen, uh -huh. I've and I've played polkas and Oktoberfests. That's great. Okay, love it. It's music. It's music. I would rather have a pair of drumsticks in my hand than a shovel or an axe. <laughs> right. Exactly. right. So, not that there, not that um, anything wrong with that, but music is good work too, right? So cool. yeah. Who were some of your early influences, Dick? That really sort of caught you. Well, as far as um, musically, the bands, um, you know, all of the big band leaders, Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, uh, Count Basie. Count Basie's got the greatest bands in the world. Uh, Harry James, Benny Goodman, uh, you know, Lionel Hampton. I mean, the list goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, as far as drummers, my first idol was uh, Gene Krupa. Mm. Uh, my dad brought home an album called The Original Drum Battle, and it was the first time that Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich played together on the same stage at the Phil, at jazz, it was Jazz at the Philharmonic in New York. Amazing. Yeah. And there's a recording of it, and if you've ever heard it, um, the excitement of the audience, Dave, is like a heavyweight fight. I mean, you know, like <laughs> well, it was. You know, when, you, when you had Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, and I mean, like the crowd, I mean, it was like, yeah, Gene Krupa and Buddy Rich, it was like, you know. That's right. And I, uh, I was introduced to Gene one night at a place in Manhattan called the Metropole, and they were actually, ABC was doing a TV show on him for a special. Yeah. But he was just such a kind man, gentleman, spent most of his time on a break with me, mm. um, encouraged me. Mm. Uh, he said that he, ho he told me, shook my hand, and looked me in the eye, and he says, I hope you're a better drummer than I am. Oh. This is Gene Krupa. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, a couple of months later, I met Buddy Rich, and that was like a whole another story. <laughs> can you tell us? Can you tell us about that story? Well, he wasn't too pleasant. <laughs> Not as kind as uh, as. No. Hey, well, Buddy was. You know, Buddy was Buddy. Um, you know, he had a beef or a gripe with everybody. Okay. You know. Okay. Um, he was a little boy that never grew up. You got to remember, he was in Vaudeville with his parents. Mm -hmm. When he was seven years old, he was making fifteen hundred dollars a week. You know how much, how many thousands of dollars yeah, that would be that's today? A lot. Wow. Yeah. And um, he was, you know, he never really had a childhood. I mean, he didn't get a chance to play like you and I did when we were kids and stuff like that. All he knew how to do was to play the drum. When you're a fish in water, do you realize that you're in water? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, he's the greatest drummer in the world yeah. because that's what he did. Right. Right. You know, he couldn't take pictures. He couldn't play golf. He, I mean, like things that you and I and other people would normally do, he couldn't do. Right. But he was exceptional with, you know, yes. he was okay. Yeah. You know, you had to get him in, a, in, in when he was in a good mood. And sometimes he was in a good mood and sometimes he wasn't. Okay. As years went on, he got to know me. Mm -hmm. um, and we had some pleasant conversations, and there were times that I felt that uh, he resented me. But I mean, that was Buddy. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and you know, when I talk with drummers or musicians, you know, we all sort of borrow from each other, whether the grooves, chops, whatever. What What were you able to take from Buddy's playing that you might have incorporated in your own, or even Gene Krupa too? Well, um, um. Everybody sees the mechanical, the visual, yeah. okay? Um, I've been asked many times, like with Buddy, what made Buddy so great? His ears. Hmm. His ears made him great, you know? I mean, he could hear a tune or a couple of tunes, like a tune a couple of times or whatever, and learn the orchestration. Okay. And that's one of the things that I learned about with the big man. When I'm playing with the big man, um, there are 14 other musicians that are playing written parts. Right. All right? Yeah. Now, if one of them hits a clam yeah. or misses a note or whatever, sure. I, don't, I don't know what the note is. I can't tell you what the note is. I don't have perfect pitch, but yeah. I can tell you who played the who, who missed the note or played the clam. Yeah. I hear everything. That's what I learned from Buddy Rich is, was his ears. Same thing with Gene. Gene was musical, you know, yeah. not so so much uh, mechanical, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, uh, plus uh, his, his mannerisms, he was, uh, Dean was a good looking guy, I mean, he could have been a movie star, you right. know, he had right. that, he had that appeal, those Absolutely. looks back in the day, you yes. know, yes. and um, it's a different thing today, you have to remember that drummers, uh, we're playing something that's called a, a set of tubs, or a Trap set or a contraption, yeah. okay? It's called a kit today. Right. And I have a problem with that word because okay. I, kits are like, kits are like for, they're in a box, they're for yeah. hobbyists. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's a good point. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, it's a, when you looked at a catalog years ago, it was called a, a drum outfit or a drum set, you right. know? Yes. And, but, Back in those days, I could listen, and I could still listen today. Play recordings. I can tell you who the drummer is. That's Gene. That's Buddy. That's Louie. That's Max. Wow. That's Chick Webb. Because they all had uh, a style, identifiable, little licks or patterns that made them stand out. That's right. Today, everybody sounds the same. You know, I just got this thing in the mail. I don't know if you can see it. It's a Casio. It's a... Yeah. Uh, yep, okay. See. And on the back, it says 30,000 percussion products in one spot. Mm -hmm. 30,000. That's a lot. Don't you think that's a little too many? That's a big drum set. <laughs> <laughs> I if, like you combined, if you combined all the musical instruments together, I don't think you have 30,000 places. Right, right. right. You know, yeah. But everybody today has their own signature drumstick and their own signature cymbal and, yeah, yeah. you know, but honestly, Dave, when it comes down to it, the guy that's sitting in the seventh row back, yeah. he doesn't care what kind of bass drum pedal you no. have or no. what kind of, you know, they don't understand that. So it's, you know, it's become a narcissist, a very narcissistic, uh, narcissistic kind of thing. You know, it's, 
it is what it is, but you know, that's sure. Yeah. What can I tell you? Yeah, no, I, I get, I get what you're saying. What, what uh, drum set or drums do you play? Dick? Well, I still have a set that I bought. My dad surprised me with a, a silver set, a silver Arco Swingerland drum set. Beautiful. When I was 16 years old, wow. and I had that, and uh, I used that, mm. and I formed the band in high school that I called the Charades with a couple of buddies that I went to school with. Nice. And the money that we made, um, I saved up, and then I bought uh, another set of drums. Yeah. And I, I have a it's a it set was made in 1966, Swingerland drum set. Yeah. And um, Swingerland at one time was considered the greatest drum company in the world. Absolutely. And uh, they actually discovered me in the late 80s, asked me to become an endorser. Very cool. And then um, they went out of business. Right, right. <laughs> so yeah. it, was, it was perfect timing. Right, uh, right. One of those challenges. One of those right. Challenges. I also have another set of drums that were manufactured by a boat builder down here in Miami called Stingray. And they were a fiberglass drum set. They were a magnificent set. Wow. And, um, uh, so I have two sets. You know, everybody has, I mean, they've got, I don't know how many drum companies there are today and how many choices there yeah, are. There's a lot. But, uh, yeah. yeah. But um, why do I play a drum set that's 50 years old? Because um, it's a magnificent musical instrument. Yeah. And um, loyalty. I, I happen to, I, you know, I happen to like old things. I, I don't think that... Uh, a lot of people today feel that like music or anything else, in order for it to be hip, or, it's got to be current, it's got to be brand new, mm-hmm. all right? Mm-hmm. And especially when it comes to music, um, if a song is good, it's always going to be good. That's right. If it, was, if it was good in the 60s or the 70s or whatever, I mean, that's, that's why we have all these stations, right? Okay. I mean, it's like we listen to the old tunes, you yeah. know? Right. I'm surprised how many young kids don't know who the Beatles are. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's surprising, isn't it, right? <laughs> you know, or, or Sir Paul McCartney. But, um, you know, every generation has its own, uh, sure. you know, group of uh, musicians. And, uh, you know, yeah, and I it's think, about music. Right. And, and so important to know your roots, right? The history of music going back. Well, to jazz. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, I've, for the last... Um, Five years, I've been trying to promote a methodology I call Reboot America Musically, which is an after-school program that's free to students, okay, that's financed by an evening performance that's sold to the general public and the population. It's a fundraiser for our military veterans, and it's also a fundraiser for our underfunded music programs in schools. You know, like the kids today... Um, you know, they have car washes and bake sales and things like that. Why don't you put on concerts? Yeah. You now, when I was coming up, you know, I would go to a high school and see Buddy Rich or Maynard Ferguson or whatever. I mean, they played high schools and colleges, all right? right? Now, even though those band leaders are deceased, mm-hmm. the music isn't, right. exactly. you know? And like, we, we've got, we have these brick and mortars. I mean, we've got... Schools, there's 100,000 schools in the United States that um, have music programs and they have theaters. And you know what? They're empty. <laughs> the seats are empty. So why don't we use, why don't we make use of these empty theaters? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We, have, we have tens of thousands of musicians around the country that have no place to play. Let's put them to work. I mean, it's like, duh, okay, you've got these buildings. They're empty. You're not being taken advantage of. You've got a music program in a school, okay, that needs funding. And you have musicians that need a place to play. And, like, you know, music, people like music. Band music is, big band music is one of the popular things. I don't know how it is around the rest of the country, but I know that here in Florida that um, if, if there's an opportunity to hear a big band or whatever, the concerts are usually well attended. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. because it's not something that you hear every day. That's right. And that's the thing. 
I like to quote Dr. Wayne Dyer, who said, the highest form of ignorance is to reject something that you don't know anything about. Dave, if you've never had vanilla ice cream, how do you know whether you like it or not? Right, exactly. Okay? And I'm not saying that jazz or big band or swing music is going to have the popularity that it once did, mm -hmm. but there's no reason why it shouldn't exist, right. you know? And I've found out dealing with high schools and students and stuff, that the kids really dig it. It's new to them, right. you know? Yes. Um, I can remember we did a concert and, you know, like you're looking out on, you have the stage lights and you're looking out at a, a dark audience, okay? And I saw this uh, in the back, uh, like a, a line of like a blue, blue green light. Mm -hmm. And upon closer examination, it was a bunch of the students, the kids, they had their cell phones, uh, okay? Right. And they had the lights. You know, like we used to do the cigarette lighter right. deal, right? Right. right? Okay. Yeah. Well, now they, now they, you, you don't have to burn yourself. You, just, right. <laughs> you know, the thing is, is that they enjoyed it because it was due to them. Right. And I want every child in the United States to at least hear a big band once in their lifetime. I mean, there are certain things in life that you, you just, you can't read them out of a book or watch them on a screen. That's you right. need to physically experience them. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. You can read about yeah. playing tennis, but until you get on the court, you know, it's different. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, that's my goal. But it's been very frustrating because the industry, even though they seem to be aware of me, they don't seem to want to help me do this. I mean, everybody thinks it's a great idea, mm. but everybody has their own agenda. I see. Okay. And, uh, you know, so um, what I need is um, notoriety. I need somebody that has, you know, you, you know, in the beginning of the, the interview, you said, uh, you know, the world's greatest drummer. Well, I'm not the world's greatest drummer, um, and it's very flattering to, to have the comparison. Um, and there are people that maybe think that way, mm -hmm. but um, there's a lot of there's <laughs> there's a bunch of great drummers yeah. in the world. There's a bunch of great musicians in the world that um, will never get their due. Sure. You know, um, in the 25 years that I led a big band, Dave. Mm -hmm. um, I generated millions of dollars, mm -hmm. not only for musicians, but for like waiters and right. bartenders yep. and yep. chefs and car jockeys. I mean, like all of the joints and places that I played, yeah. these people made a living or made an income right. because of yep. me. That's right. That's right. You know, and um, so I made millions of dollars, just I didn't get to keep any of it. <laughs> <laughs> Where, gave, where are those royalty checks? Right? Yeah, right. I gave it. I gave it all away, a little bit at a time. But you know, I feel good about that as well because um, there were kids. I mean, there were kids that weren't legally old enough to be in the club, and I let play in the band. Uh, right? That got to sit next to seasoned musicians that played with musicians like that worked with Count Basie or Buddy Rich or or whatever. That experience. Yeah. You know, and what I feel proud about is the fact that a lot of them have gone on and they've become successful. I mean, they really have. I mean, uh, uh, there's a trumpet player. His name is Brian McDonald. He plays lead with the United States Air Force Band. I remember when, you know, he first played in the band. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> Go home. Yeah, uh, you know, like now he's married, he's, he's got a family, and he, he's traveling around the, the country and the world, and I mean, he's a success. Mm -hmm. Another trumpet player named Jason Carter, a young fella too, he's been touring with uh, Yanni. Oh. I mean, it's just, yeah, you know, I mean, um, and I mean, it's not necessarily just, you know, like jazz or big band music or whatever. I mean, they, they've gone on to do their own things, you yeah. know? Yeah. So, even though I've never been a dad, or a parent, um, in a lot of ways, I feel uh, I feel proud, you know? I mean, I, I've helped a lot of people get uh, cars, yeah. uh, mortgages for their house. I mean, I was an employer, yeah. you know? And uh, uh, 
I was also a slave. <laughs> I broke my back carrying all that crap around. <laughs> right. A lot of instruments in a big band, isn't there? Yeah, right. What's a roadie? Right. Well, you gotta pay you gotta pay for them. Yeah, that's right. That's right. How many people so, how many people in your band, Dick? Well, the band was fifteen pieces. It consisted of five saxes, uh, three trombones, four trumpets, piano, bass, and drum. And then on different occasions, uh, I work with uh, vocalists, either like a male vocalist or a female vocalist. Okay. Uh, back in the 80s, I put a group together called the Swing Sisters. There were three girls that uh, they used to do all the, uh, the old Andrew Sisters and yeah. the Choir Sisters things, you know. It's and, uh, you know, the chicks are hot and the audience yeah. likes them. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, right. so it was, uh, yeah. it, was, it was fun and entertaining. Yes. Um, you know, well, sound, sounds like, you, you know, with your career, you've been able to mentor young musicians, which must be really rewarding. You talked about helping them. But also, it sounds like, you know, not everybody gets the, the gold record or the million thing, but you've, you've been able to make a living professionally playing music. That's amazing. Well, I've been able to pound it out. From yeah, the country, right. You know, right. it, but it's the truth. You know, my point, my point, David, was that, um, I know so many talented musicians that will never be rich and famous, that will never get any notoriety whatsoever, but yet, you know, get the satisfaction of, uh, uh, you know, the applause. You know, I toured, uh, well, I mean, I've, I've done a couple of tours uh, back in the 70s um, with this country pop group. Um, we, we rode around in a Volkswagen bus, you know, yeah, like yeah. one of those old, sure. you know, like the hippie buses. Of course, like, right. You, you sure. remember, right? Yeah. Okay. And we stayed at Holiday Inn and we yeah. played at all of these yeah. Amazing. <laughs> joints. Right. And um, uh, then, you know, like I also toured with the Tommy Dorsey's orchestra with, the, with Buddy Morrow. Oh. and the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. And that would probably be one of the highlights of my life because all of the greatest drummers in the world got to play in that drum chair. I mean, Dean, Buddy, Louie, I mean, yeah. if you were a great drummer, yeah. you played in it. So um, before Buddy actually broke up the band, I was able to do uh, some of the last few tours with him. Amazing. But here's the thing. You're riding around on a bus. A bus. Yeah. Two seats. Not, not one of these custom motorhomes or whatever, like, you know, the hot shots, you know. Sure. Your space is a bus, so you got your room under the seat, and you got <laughs> that's right, and, and that's it. Yeah, right. And you ride, and you ride, and you ride for miles and miles and miles. Right. Okay. We did a gig in Lawton, Oklahoma. Oh my God, what a godforsaken place! There was actually a. Um, uh, they used to be the Percussive Art Society had an office and a uh, museum for drums there. Okay. Uh, for you know and. Um, we got to play there. I mean, you ride for hours yeah. and, uh, you know, do the gig. Yeah. And it's the applause. It's like, yes, it's like that 15 or 20 seconds or 30 seconds or whatever. Yeah. Make it all worthwhile. Yeah. Why, do you, why do you ride on a bus for six or seven hours to go from one gig to another gig or whatever? Right. It's because it makes you happy and it makes other people happy. That's right, yeah. It's a powerful you know, and it And it is, right. And I mean, that's why I do it. I think that's why most musicians do it. Sure. I mean, there are some that are egotistical and like, you know, yeah. sure. they, yeah. <laughs> they're the greatest, they're the fastest, they're the right. whatever, the, the, the most musical. But most musicians, they go, they get, they, were, they are unrewarded, but, um, you know, they do it for the, the satisfaction that they're bringing happiness to somebody else. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. what a musician does. Right. That's why we have, you know, look, the, the, the title of, uh, you know, your thing, you know, Musicians on the Record. I mean, it's sort of like a double thing. Records. Right. But, you know, records were made to be played. Yeah. You know, you don't play a record one time. You don't right. play a song necessarily one time. Right. 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 You, know, you may not watch may not watch a movie or a TV show, you know, over and over and over again. Yes. I mean, you may might watch it more than once or twice or whatever, but music, yeah. and, you know, God, as a kid coming up, I can listen. I mean, I, there were songs that I listened to over and over again, a hundred times in a row. Right, exactly. 
Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's you know yeah. stuff music. that gets, gets in your heart and soul, right? All that music. Right? Exactly. You know, it, it's a gift. I feel sorry for people that don't understand it, and there are people that don't understand it. Sure. I mean, there are people that, like with a big band, they think you can control the volume like you can on a radio. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> just, just turn it down. Can you make it? Can you make it a little lower, a little right. softer? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I have 15 musicians right. here <laughs> that have to that have a certain amount of. Uh, yeah. physical effort you know like they have to bow and strike and hit things right. and then i right. can't make it you know it can only be what it is but right. you know that's right yeah that's <laughs> and then there are the there are the people that say um i want a big band i want a big band sound mm -hmm. uh, but i don't want a big band mm. like i i want i want four pieces and they want four pieces to sound like 15 pieces yeah, well. and then you try to ex and then you try to explain to these people that well there's a reason why a big band it's called the big band because right. <laughs> it's big. That's right. Yeah. You can't really and, get that sound out of it. And even though we can play the songs or the melodies, yeah. the orchestrations are not the same. I mean, how are you going to make four pieces sound like three trombones and four trumpets? And right. you know, you can't do that. Can't do but there are actually people that they don't comprehend that. I mean, they just they don't. And that's kind of sad because sure. they don't understand music, you know. Sure. Yeah, and, so, the, and certainly the big band, that's not, I mean, you could, but that's not the point of, like, coming out of a box or being digital. You want that live. You want that, uh, you know, people playing together. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And and that's the other thing. I mean, the, the, uh, the camaraderie of it, okay? I mean, when you're, when... There's nothing, there's nothing like it, Dave, when you've got like 13 or 14 or 15 cats, okay, and like, they're all uh, of equal uh, ability and talent, and you want to do something and, uh, you know, yeah, you know, I mean, music is a universal language. You could go to Japan, you could go to India, you could go to Africa, you could go anywhere, That's right. and if you have music and you have musicians, it's the universal language. They all sound alike. They all play alike. I mean, it's like, what other, what, what else, you know, like, I mean, how many things on this planet can you do? And talk about uh, organization. Mm, right. Um, for most of my career, I never rehearsed again because the musicians were just of that caliber. I could put a piece of music in front of them and they could sight read it. Holy cow. You know? Yeah. And then what also happens is that, well, when you work week after week, month after month or whatever, you know, you become familiar with each other. You know, you know, the likes and dislikes, the style of how musicians play yes. or whatever. And, um, um, you know, um, they're, they're fabulous. I, I, I can't do that. I, 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 yeah. I have no idea how these guys can sight read. I mean, I've learned how to read music. Yep. All right, but I've never been, that's never been one of my it's forte, a tough thing. you know. It's tricky, right? Very tricky. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was like Buddy Rich. He was very insecure because he couldn't read music. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he used to think that the guys would make fun of him. There's a whole bunch of stories that are really <laughs> hilarious okay. yeah. about, uh, about him with that. But, um, yeah, he was very insecure that he couldn't read music. See, See that was the best thing in the world because if he had to read something that somebody else told him to play, right, right, right. he would not have been the world's greatest drummer. Exactly. He was the world's greatest drummer because he was free to do his own thing. That's right. It came from within him, right? Right. Not, not this or that or whatever, you know, right. That, you know, I mean, uh, so what, uh, you know, it, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I know people that are self-taught, right. How, how they manage to do it. I mean, you know, <laughs> exactly. yeah, that blows my mind too so it's you know i've heard uh you know I've, I've never been in a big band but the being the drummer in the big band usually you're the leader of the group or that's certainly the way it used to be uh it's like i've heard like piloting or taking off a 747 um i don't know if that metaphor fits for you but what is that like being the drummer in the big band and really the band leader well, a big band drummer 
has the most, I mean, it's more noticeable than probably in any other genre of music. You could take, you could take 14 musicians, Dave, and um, uh, take 14 different drummers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. play the same music, yeah. okay, and the drummer is going to pick his own equipment. He's going to have his own choice of drums and cymbals and this and that and everything else, okay, because he has his own sound or style, right. all right? And what I'm saying is that the band will sound different. Right. Every drummer will make that band sound different. That's how important it is. Mm. You know, like in smaller groups or whatever, rock, pop or whatever, it's, you know, if you're playing time and you're doing your thing, that's fine and dandy. But really, it's, uh, you know... And the band leader, drummers just naturally seem to be better band leaders because they're the motivator. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, they're the locomotive. They're the ones that, you know, they're making this ride happen. Right. You know? Yep. Um, they used to say, uh, well, let me say, how is it, how do you put it? Uh, you know, like if you got a really, if you got a really bad drummer, well, then, you know, you got a bad band. But if you got a really good drummer, you got to, you know, I mean, it, sure. the drummer makes the band. That's right. It really does. I mean, you know. Yeah. You know, when it's you. More, were, it's more noticeable. It, it, you know, it, it's more prominent in, uh, uh, in a big band situation. Sure. Simply because it has to be. Right. Right. And it's very um, expressive, in, improvisational at times as well. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you're, you're playing a um, set. Uh, orchestration right. okay yeah. but there are spots that are open to improvisation right. by other musicians right you know? yeah. so it's uh yeah. you know that's the really beautiful thing right yeah yeah, yeah. It, it really is you know yeah. i mean anybody that plays in a big band um you know i can remember the very first time i played it was at berkeley mm -hmm. i was in boston mm -hmm. and uh, i played in an ensemble Mm. And the very first tune I played was something that Buddy Rich recorded. It was a rock and roll thing called Whack Whack. I don't know if you remember the they tune or not. Uh, whack, whack, whack Whack. Whack Whack. whack. W-A-C-K. Yeah. It went like that. Da, 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 da. Whack Whack. Da, 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 da. I'm trying to think. It was, there was a piano player that made a... Um, Ramsey, I think it was Ramsey Lewis. Do you remember Ramsey Lewis, the piano no, player? I do not. Okay, you know, black piano player. He had like a trio. Interesting. And uh, he had a hit record with it, and they made like a big band arrangement out of it. Great. And it was the first time that I played with a big band. Yeah. And I'll tell you, <laughs> you can play along with records, and you yeah. can practice all you want. Right. But until you really do it. Exactly, yes. Because... Yeah, I'm the one that's keeping time, and like if I slow down, or I right. and that's the other thing, see, because as fabulous as some musicians are with sight reading, when you are reading something, mm. you tend you have a tendency to want to kind of slow down a little bit. Sure, sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. And one of the things that made Buddy as great as he was was the fact that he played on top of the beat, like he was. Yeah, he was like always pushing, motivating. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, some people sometimes annoyingly where they say, "Well, you sped up or whatever." But I mean, that's ah. being nick, nick. You know, you're just being nitpicky. Sure. But yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you don't want to uh, slow down the band, and that's the other thing. I, I see a lot of kids today that are in colleges or whatever, and they're playing along with the band. Mm -hmm. That's not what the drummer does in the band. Yeah. The band, you you motivate, you listen, you yes. you know, you try to cover up what's bad and, and enhance what's good. Right. You know, you want you want you know you want the cats in the band uh, to play their ass off. Period. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So in uh, in addition to that, Dick, the, the yes. listening, motivating. In your in your mind, what makes a good drummer, whether big band or otherwise? But somebody comes to you and says, "Dick, I want to I want to be in a big band and be the drummer." What what are, what advice are you going to give them? Well, the first thing would be to develop your ears. Yeah, listen, listen and watch. You know, I um, 
the other day, uh, I had a wonderful telephone conversation with a, another legendary drummer. His name is Roy Byrne. Sure. Yeah. And Roy, Roy played with Benny Goodman and, uh, oh, God, yeah. Lionel Hampton. And he's the founder of Aquarium. Yes, drum yes. products, the drum head company, okay? Yeah. And I met I met him many years ago. He's a wonderful man. Yes. I learned so much from him. Yeah. And funny. He's got the greatest yeah. he's got the greatest sense of humor that most cats don't get. Yeah. I remember the first time I saw him at a clinic, you know, he's talking and he's telling these, you know, like dry sly jokes, you know. Right. I'm, right. I'm getting the biggest kick at it and all of these kids are looking at me like what the, hell's, <laughs> what the hell are you laughing at? Right, right. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, but I had a wonderful conversation with him the other day, yeah. and we were talking about, you know, he he grew up, I think, in Kansas City. Yes. He used to ride on a bus four hours to, to take a drum lesson. Right. right. Yeah. Today, you've got the internet, you got DVDs, you got this, you got that, you got everything else. You've got you've got so many choices. You know, yeah. when I was coming up, I mean, I had to go to the next town, mm -hmm. but Right. Got a pair of drumsticks, yeah. a rubber pad, right. and a manuscript book. I had a hope that the teacher that I had knew what, his, knew what he was doing, sure. you know? Right. And what, what, what troubles me today is that there is such a wealth of information, yeah. there's so, much, so little of it that goes towards the music end. Sure. It's all about the mechanics, mm. you know? I mean, right. yes, you, gotta, you have to develop technique with any instrument. Uh, you know, I mean, um, there was a college professor years ago that wrote an article for Berkeley, and uh, he, uh, he he had what he called, uh, well, he wrote uh, about what he thought was, uh, what he called the 10,000 hour theory. Yes. Mm -hmm. And his uh, mentality or thinking was that in order for you to be good, I mean, really good, not just average, but I mean really good profession, yeah. you know, proficient, yeah. okay? And it didn't matter whether you were a doctor, a lawyer, mm. a thief, right. uh, or, you know, you rob cars for a living, okay? Yeah. If you spent at least $10,000, well, then you're at the, the height of your profession. Right. Yeah. And, um, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gotta get some hours uh, in, right? Yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, I just, I wish more attention would be towards the music and, and you know, less towards, uh, you know. Kids today they hear what they, they see, what they hear. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid growing up, I listened to music. I would uh, sometimes close my eyes and just crank up the stereo and, and absorb the music. Um, today, uh, it's all visual. That's why you have the, the backup dancers and the smoke and the mirrors and, right. and whatever else, because if you actually listen to the music, yeah. you'd realize that there really isn't anything there. I mean, how can you compare anything that's being done today with, you know, sure. George and Ira Gershwin or right. Irving Berlin or, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know, I mean, the great American songbook. Those were songs. Those were melodies. Those were standards. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, do you remember? Do you remember what a fake book is? What is it called? A fake book. Fake book. N no, I don't. You've never heard of a fake book. No, okay. Sorry, no. Well, a fake book is a book that at the time was supposedly illegal. You weren't supposed to get them, but everybody knew they existed. Okay. <laughs> okay. Interesting. And what it was was a book that had lead sheets of hundreds of songs. Oh, interesting. Okay. So that if you were a working musician yeah. and you were gigging, Got okay, it. It. you took this book with you. And if you didn't know the tune, right. you'd open the page and that's it. A fake book. A fake book. <laughs> kids, today, kids today don't know what a fake book oh. is. See, this is great history, I think, that for kids, musicians uh, watching this in the future, what, there might be even a new Google by then, who knows, but, you know, right. to, to look this stuff up and to learn the, the rich history around some of the music by someone who's, who's made a living at doing it that. So is there anybody that you feel like is even close to it, uh, today, whether drummers or other musicians who you feel like 
they are honoring the music they're they're listening well one drummer in particular comes to mind his name is daniel glass sure sure and um daniel i met daniel a few years ago he called me up he was doing a, a clinic down here and uh he wanted to meet with me. Nice. Um, he's he's a great guy. Uh, I have problems with him because he's a Southpaw. He, <laughs> he plays left. He plays lefty. You know. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. There's a yeah. there's a lot of great Southpaws. Sure, sure, right. <laughs> but um, I see him as uh, a, a real a historian. He's done a, a couple of things with like Vic Firth and a, a yes. few other drum companies on his right. videos. Uh, the yep. history of drumming yes. and the history of the drum set. That's right. Um, yep. You know, everybody else out there today is peddling themselves or promoting themselves or their products or this or that or gimmicks or whatever. Sure. Daniel, you know, he's a real musician um, and he's sincere. And uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, he's, he's doing well for himself and I hope he continues, I, you know. Right. Yeah. Excellent drummer. Excellent musician. Right. Yeah. A great guy. I mean, you know, nice man. Yeah. And really, really honoring the history of, of drums. Really. Right. Right. And rather than look at me, how, you know, I'm flashy. I'm fast. I can do this and that or whatever. You know, no, he, he's sincere about it. And, yeah. and that's, you know, again, um, I mean, I have an instructional DVD. Um, I was requested to make one. Not that I really wanted to, okay. um, but I got discovered through the band. Okay. I was sending out, I was sending out VHS tapes of me with the band. Mm. And then there were cats that were making copies of them, and they were sending them around to other people. And like, Great. all of a sudden, I'm hearing from guys around the country that I don't even know who these people are, and they're saying, you know, you have a drum video to get, you know, do you teach? Yeah. And uh, um, I'll tell you a funny story. I took an ad out of Modern Drummer Magazine, mm -hmm. which was back in 1994, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. All right. And I paid $1,500 for the ad. Yeah. I didn't have a video. Mm -hmm. All right. And I figured, well, I'll run the ad, yeah. and I don't know if anybody's going to want to buy it. Right. What's the sense? What's the sense of even making one? Okay. I didn't make one. Okay. okay, and then I then the ad come out came out, and then I started getting phone calls. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> and then you made when, it. <laughs> when the money, yeah, when the checks started coming in sure. and the credit cards and everything yeah. else, I said, uh, "Oh, I better make a video." <laughs> <laughs> That's a guy that I'm through. That's, That's a guy that I'm through. And you know, I got that. I I kind of stole that idea from Desi Arnaz, hmm? Lucy's husband. Sure. Okay. Sure. There's a story when he came from uh, Cuba, Miami. He went up and down the Ocean Boulevard there in Miami Beach, trying to find a gig. Oh, he was as a conga player. I mean, he wasn't a great musician or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he went from hotel to hotel or whatever, telling all of these nightclub managers or the owners or whatever that he had a band. He didn't have a band. Okay. But he finally found somebody that hired. Is non-existent then. <laughs> so, this is the lesson that you learn. That's right. If you have, if you have work, right, you can put a band together. There you, you go. Can always, if you can pay a musician, you can right. find a musician. There you go. That's create. That's creativity right there, Dick. That's excellent. <laughs> it, it, it's funny. That's the truth. And Desi Arnaz. That, that's that's where I got that from. That's great. That's, my very first gig before I played at the Holiday Inn was at a, a Drear Park Zoo. It was a zoo. It was an outdoor gig. And um, um, I hired, uh, I was given a list of musicians from the, the Musicians uh, Union. Yeah. And I hired these people. Um, I had a bunch of t-shirts made up with my name on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hired these guys. And 15 of us uh, showed up at this park. Oh. And we played a gig, unrehearsed, nothing. And wow. I mean, that's yeah. how I got the band. That's going, amazing. You know? That's amazing. But again, it was a situation that I told this uh, uh, booking agent that I had a band. Yeah, great. But I didn't, I didn't have a band. <laughs> <laughs> you did then. You did have that. <laughs> What's so, the name? 
for, for anybody who wants to get it, Dick, what's the name of your DVD? Uh, well, just go to worldsgreatestdrummer.com. Okay. okay. And um, all the information is there. It's online. I have a couple of them. I actually have uh, three different uh, mm. DVDs. One's called Secrets of the World's Greatest Drummer. Okay. And more Secrets of the World's Greatest Drummer. And then I have another one that's called The Workout, which is basically just me sitting behind a pad and, uh, mm. uh, you know, sharing yeah. some technique. That's fantastic. Great. And for, for someone, is the information there too, Dick, as far, for somebody who wants to learn more about the Music Restoration Project? Uh, uh, yes. Well, uh, you can go, to, you can learn about that by uh, uh, just going to uh, RebootAmericaMusically.com. Yes. Yes. Got or it. you could also go to HelpUsRebootAmerica.com. I have both of those domain names. And yeah. if you want to see, um, you know, I've done concerts for Memorial Day, for Pearl Harbor Day, and uh, nice. you know, I have uh, a lot of respect for our veterans, sure. right. which I don't feel get enough of attention, you know? Right. Exactly. It's wonderful, your service that you do for them. Right? Well, I try, yeah. you know? I mean, uh, listen, if uh, anybody that was born after 1945 owes uh, sure. our lives and gratitude to these people, Absolutely. you know? Um, and it's sad that uh, even now that uh, uh, so many come back. I mean, they, they say that 33 men or women a day commit suicide that were in the military. I mean, just from the, you know, you can't go to war and shoot people or whatever and, and come back and be normal in society, you know? So, you know, we, we really, not, we really, um, owe these people a lot of gratitude. So whatever I can do, whatever I can do it for them, uh, yeah. I try, you know? It's really great. It's really wonderful. Yeah. And a, and a couple of more questions, Dick, as far as, you know, you've been drumming for a, a really long time. You have 50 years, 50 years. And, and well, actually let's do this first. Let's, can we play a, a little bit of a musical word association game. I'll mention some drummers and you just say right off the top of your head what stories come to mind. Okay. Okay, because you've certainly made, uh, met some great drummers. So, Max Roach. Okay. Um, I met Max Roach, uh, let's see, probably back in, uh, well, I mean, I was always familiar with Max Roach. Mm. He's one of the pioneers. Yeah. Um, pop player. He, um, uh, master of the uh, hi-hat. Um, but I was introduced to him by a gentleman named Ellis Tolan. Mm -hmm. And Ellis uh, is the father of uh, Rogers Dynasonic snare drum. He had a uh, music store with a, a gentleman named Bill Welch called Music City in, in uh, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. And they knew everybody. And um, uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> Max definitely has his own style. I mean, I I can hear him just listening to Max Roach. I don't have to look at him. I can just hear him playing, and I know that that's Max Roach. He, he definitely has his own style. Great. Uh, how about Art Blake? I met him in Boston at the uh, Jazz Cellar. There was a nightclub uh, a couple of blocks away on uh, from our, uh, on Boylston Street. Uh, again, uh, uh, another wonderful musician. Um, I didn't get to know him personally, but again, uh, another unique style of playing. He used to play like certain licks that you just you just knew it was him, yeah. you know. Um, and again, uh, you know, uh, an innovator. I mean, uh, <laughs> Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers. I mean, one of the most famous groups in the world. Sure, sure, right. How about Louis Belson? Ah, uh, Louis, what a wonderful man. Yeah. Such a kind gentleman. Mm -hmm. I have letters that, personal letters that he hand wrote to me from hotel room mm -hmm. when he was traveling around the country. That right. Um, uh, I can remember going to see him at gigs and uh, after the gig was over with and he got his equipment packed up or whatever, he would actually come and sit down with me or my father at the table and talk. Wow. Um, wonderful man. Innovator. Um, probably the most all-around talented 
percussionist because uh, aside from him playing the drums, he was also an arranger and a composer. He, you know, he wrote orchestrations himself. Amazing. Um, he came from a musical family. His brother, Hank, played drums too. And, uh, Interesting. Um, but just a, one of the nicest, kindest men I've ever met in my entire life, uh, Louis Wilson. Mm. And, uh, you know, he, he played with two people. I mean, he played with everybody. Sure. He's married to Ella Fitzgerald. Wow, I did not now, know that. Um, Yeah, I mean, he was very, very kind to me. Uh, you know, one of, Dean was very kind to me. Louis was very kind to me. Um, and, mm. and uh, you know, I mean, just the master, the uh, innovator of the, the, the double bass drum, you yes, know. exactly. Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, Louis, I, uh, I miss him. He yeah. uh, he's quite a guy. And another, you know, another, another person that, whose kindness um, inspired me and yeah. motivated me. Yeah. And that's what I try to do with other people as well. You know, I don't really teach. Like I said, I, I don't think of myself as teaching. What happens these days, Dave, is like um, people will come into town and they may be on vacation with their wife or whatever, and uh, uh, they don't want to go shopping or whatever, but they want to hang out with me for a little yeah. bit, yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, so, you know, uh, we sit down, we talk. Uh, I let them play for me a little bit. And you know, I try to direct or help them in whatever it is that they're looking to uh, improve on, sure, you know, sure. pay forward. Yeah. I mean, and that's, that's what I try to do. That's right. You know, all of the material things that we have in this world, we're not taking them with us. Right, right, exactly. So um, all we have is what we leave in the minds of other people, sure. you know, and... Um, over the years, um, I've gotten some um, wonderful letters and emails. Some of them actually make me very emotional. I, 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 I cry that um, somebody says, well, something that I did or said or played uh, inspired them. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, and um, that's what it's all about. <laughs> that's right. You know? Well, and you, you know, you talked about getting that inspiration from Gene Krupa and, and Shaughnessy and Louis Belson, and like you said, now passing it forward, paying it forward. That's really important. So, um, last couple of questions, then, Dick, with your drumming. I mean, I have a an impression of you that I mean, you can play just about anything. What are you still working on as far as your drumming? Finding a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Give this man a job. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah anybody out there need a drummer? I can play. <laughs> that pays. You got to pay me, though. Yeah, of course, right? Um, job. Yeah. I, uh, well, actually, what I'm working on is just trying to maintain what I've developed over the year. Okay. Yeah. That's um, important. Yeah. There was a time when I actually quit <clears throat> playing. Yeah. I didn't pick up a pair of drumsticks for three years. Wow. Yeah. Except to move them out of the way. Yeah. If they were in the way or something, I, yeah, let me get out of the way. Okay. Yeah. And then I decided that, well, let me let me get back to playing again. Sure. And it, it, it took effort. It, um, uh, it was a slow process. Mm -hmm. you, you don't lay off something for three months. Uh, and just right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> pick it up again, That's okay. Right. But um, uh, it's good. I mean, it just it's good exercise. I you know I'm 68 years old. I've had uh, five heart attacks. Wow. I've got nine stents in me. I, I mean, literally, I should be dead. Why I'm here, I guess only God knows. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've survived a cruise ship fire, a car accident. I mean, I'm like El Fago Baca, the man with nine lives. Right. Uh, Amazing. Yeah, it really is. Uh, so my health, you know, I'm just trying to, you know, I've got problems with my back as well. Okay. Um, a lot of guys say, well, you got back problems because you played the drums. Mm. No, playing the drums is what can cause the back problems. Carrying them around and the, all the band equipment and, that, and lugging all of that stuff yes. yeah. is what took its toll on me. Nice. You know, when you're young, you don't, you know, you don't think about those things. Sure. You know, even like I see like a lot of guys. Well, like Buddy did it too when he was younger. Okay, like the height of the crash symbols, like they're mm -hmm. real high. Yes. 
And you know, like as you get older, it's wear and tear on your shoulder. I, I've had a, ro a torn rotator cuff on okay. this one. Yeah. And it's due, it's due to the thousands of repetitions over the years. You know, you don't realize it. Absolutely. So uh, I'm just trying to stay healthy. Yeah. And, um, you know, if the opportunity presents itself to play, um, hopefully uh, yeah. I'll get to play again. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that sounds like a great thing. And, you know, for we, t we touched a little bit on this before, Dick, but for young and upcoming musicians, uh, musicians watching this in the future, what's the kind of couple biggest things or advice that you would say to them about music and with their craft? Well, it depends where you want to go with it. And um, I mean, it's a commitment. A musician, a true musician, <laughs> it's a lifelong commitment of, um, of dedication. And it's going to be disappointing. It's going to be frustrating. Um, there's all kinds of competition, you know, uh, nepotism, uh, I mean, you can go down the line, okay, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, if you want to do it just simply for the pleasure of it, I mean, that's a great thing, I mean, as a hobby or whatever, um, you know, it's tough, most musicians become part-time musicians anyway you know like you have a, a full-time gig and then you know you you play um that's sort of been, you know the the standard thing for for many many years yes um but um if you have the talent you have the passion and you love it and it's what you want to do then um do everything you can to uh uh master it you know you don't want to be a jack of all trades and a master of nothing right um you're gonna to have to woodshed to put your time in mm -hmm. the one thing that i would say to young future musicians is that if you do want to pursue it do it while you're young okay i you know i mean i think about when i was 16 15 16 years old like during the summer i would spend the entire day behind the drums i'd be on a pad i'd play on the drums i'd play along with records i'd study i'd do exercises uh, i mean it was like six seven eight hours sure. a day Amazing. okay yeah. but i was young and i had the time to do it when you're older and you have responsibilities and a job or a family or whatever else you, you're not it's not going to be that easy so um, I, I can understand that if you want to take up an instrument, take it up when you're young. Yeah. Um, a lot of the musicians or a lot of guys that uh, I've come to meet played when they were young. Okay. Some of them played when they were in high school. Some of them actually did and paid their way through college. Wow, that's great. They got jobs. They got married. Okay. Now they're getting close to retirement. Okay, and they don't want to be on a golf course hanging a ball around or whatever, right? They'd rather play a set of drums. Okay, sure. so like now they want to get back into it. Right. Not that they want to go out and gig, yeah. okay, but that you know, it's for satisfaction, to That's right. down, even if it's you know, with a pair of headphones or whatever, and play along to recording. Uh, yeah. uh, it's great, so yeah, you know, um, uh, it's a commitment, it's uh, for sure. But if uh, you're going to get involved in it, do it when you're young. Try to invest as much time in it as you possibly can when you're young. And listen, listen, and watch everybody you can. Not just your favorite musician or your favorite band or your, or your favorite style of music. Listen to everybody. Listen to, you know, um, that's what I did. You know, I didn't have, you know, like I was saying earlier when we were talking with uh, Roy Burns, you know, we didn't have DVDs and videos and uh, yes. um, all of the method books and the internet that kids have today. You know, uh, we had a rubber pad. And, and if you had an opportunity to see somebody on TV, it was lucky. Right. And, you didn't have a, and you didn't have a VCR. So you only got to see it one time, That's you right. know. So, 
uh, you know, it's uh, yeah. today have it lucky uh, as far as uh, technology. Yes. I just wish they would be more creative with it. Right. Right. Yeah, and that listening thing is definitely uh, an important part, right? Yeah. Absolutely. The drummer's got to listen. Uh, the, the drummer, I mean, uh, it doesn't matter not only in a big band, but I mean, in, in any size band, and any, you know, you, <laughs> it's the drummer. He's got to listen. He's got to right. compliment the rest of the musicians. Yes. Not think about what he's going to play next because this is what he practiced. You know, there were guys that are out there that, you know, they, uh, when, you, when you hear them play, you can hear them play exercise four on page 32 out of this book. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's not musical it's you know you're just being mechanical that's right that's and um you know music is not about i mean music is about mechanics but it's you know it's about rhythm and, and emotion and uh yeah. uh wonderful thing yeah. this is what you're doing is a wonderful thing well, thank you thank you well this has been fa uh, been fantastic dick to talk with you this feels like a, a music lesson and a history lesson Thank you so much, Dick Cully, for being on Musicians on the Track. Well, thank you for even considering me for this. I hope um, uh, I hope it benefits somebody out there. It's up to you.